Yo, Bugsy, it says here they got something called the Vegas Mob Tour. Yeah, Bobby, ain't you heard? It's all about our old friends, Sam G and Connor, Meyer Lansky, Mo Dalitz, and of course, yours truly, Bugsy Siegel. Are you kidding? A mob tour about us? Yeah, they take you to where we used to hang out and to where all the places where we used to do our crimes. You mean they expose all our secrets? Yeah, but it's okay, because we ain't around anymore. So, let's face it, <laughs> we can't get busted. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you think we can sneak on board and check this out? Of course we can. Forget about it. They'll never even know we're there. Hey everybody, welcome back. It's Mob Vlog. Adam Flowers here on March 2nd, 2022. And uh, I have with us today not only Red Wamet, but also Gary Jenkins. If you guys don't know who Gary, uh, Gary is, he's a former uh, Kansas City police detective who was involved with, uh, with a lot of the uh, Kansas City organized crime investigations. Uh, so he's probably the, the, the best thing we have to talk to about the Kansas City and Chicago outfit connection. So guys, welcome back. It's my vlog. Red Wimette, Gary Jenkins. Welcome aboard, guys. Hey, hey Adam. How are you today, Gary? I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I'm a little bit hassled. I rode my motorcycle across the city in about 20 minutes, which should take me about 40 minutes today trying to get back for the show, but I'm good. Uh, uh, you're right, Ren. I was in and out, man. You got you got that retired police officer badge. You can do <laughs> I that. do. I do. I do. <laughs> I got a line. I say, you wouldn't ride an old retired cop or a ticket, would you? And they go, oh, oh you, are you, where'd you work? <laughs> Unbelievable. It's good to have you with us today, Gary. And I'm sure that uh, the, the viewers are going to have a lot of questions. Red, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. The sun is shining and I'm happy. <laughs> All right, then. So it sounds like it's a good day in Florida for you. And uh, I think this is going to be fun today. So uh, just want to say hello to a few people. If you guys are new here, we talk about the Chicago outfit, organized crime, uh, and we do it live every Wednesday. We call it Redness Day because we have Red Wimet with us. And we were doing that for about a year. Um, but all we talk about is Chicago subjects, and it's you guys that ask the questions. It's you guys that make the comments, and it's you guys that have the discussions in the sidebar that we follow along with. So I just want to say hello to you, uh, all the uh, prescribers, as we call them here. Don't jump on my back for saying that. It's a prescriber, not a prescriber, not a subscriber, prescriber, okay? And uh, so let's say hello to some of them. Uh, James Guerrero, Bobby Bag of Donuts, Scott, I saw that Joe Lombardo's house did sell for 600000 and I also read that the person who was keeping Joey Lombardo's house is going to be restoring it. I don't know for what reason. I don't know, but... Who knows, right? We'll find out. Frank Ferraro, uh, John uh, Calagiros or Calagiros, <laughs> Keith Helton, Street Story, Sean Pender, Greg Hart in Florida. Good to have you with us. Carl Foster, uh, looks like Kathy Jean's been showing up uh, the last few weeks, as well as David Grimpy. Good to have you guys with us. And uh, Carl Foster, Jim Yeager, the whole crew's here today. Scott H., it's good to see you. And Leon rolling along, Don Chichio, Deep Portzalo. I'm telling you, Homan Sanders is even here with Joey Ayupa. And uh, Turd Ferguson and Mike N are also in the house. Tim DeMarce or DeMarque, I don't know. Either way, Greg Polly, it's good to have you with us. Ted Tedford Von Patriot and the Duke of Dunhurst, Brett. Those are all, those are actual members of, of Mob Vlog. So thanks, Greg, Tedford. And uh, Brent, appreciate you guys being here, as well as Modesto Torres. So, with all of that, and we're a few minutes into this thing, let's open it up to what you guys want to talk about today, as far as the Kansas City connection to Chicago. I know, Gary, you said in our last interview, and this is the second time that, that Gary's on. So, in our last interview, we discussed, um, we discussed a lot of different things, but one of the main questions I have and that I know I hear a lot about is um, William Kirchmayer. You're not invisible. I'm sorry. Didn't didn't mean to skip over you, buddy. I'm, I apologize. Hey Bill. hey, Bill. Lefty Rosenthal 
and the car bombing and Nick Sevilla, the connection. Because Frank Collado always said that there was there was a connection there, and it was possibly Nick Sevilla, and maybe they found out that Lefty Rosenthal was an informant, and because of that, they thought, but he's got to go. What are your thoughts on that, Gary? Oh, I'd have to agree with my friend, uh, my late friend Frank uh, Collada. Uh, you know, I, I've listened to a lot of the wiretaps and some of the uh, planted the microphones, read the transcripts, and there was a lot of discussion about Lefty Rosenthal. There was a, a, about how much trouble he was causing, how much heat he was bringing down from the Gaming Commission, and how the you know the bureau was going to be right behind the Gaming Commission. Uh, with Lefty have this ongoing battle court case with him. He, you know, the famous uh, confrontation he had with Harry Reid, who was the chairman of the Gaming Commission, and, and it was all over the place. And, and Nick Savella, actually, one time, there, there were several times that they mentioned that he might be a stool pigeon. You know, those guys, they, they, they don't call him a snitch or an informant or anything. They always call him a stool or a stool pigeon. So they talked about he could be a stool pigeon, and, and he was... One thing Nick Savella didn't like was he was threatening Harry Reid with some kind of exposure. Now, the only thing he would say was that you had lunch with me one day, and Harry Reid said, I don't remember, I had, a lot, I had lunch with a lot of people, but they did not like that he was that he was threatening to expose Harry Reid and bringing heat on Harry Reid. So, so well, the they, press, they did. The press too. And they're a prostitute too, and and they did not like that at all, and uh, so you know I would say Nick Savella had as much to do with the possible murder of Lefty Rosenthal or attempted murder in this case because they did not like him at all for those reasons that I just said. So that was in your documentary, that. Gangland Wire. I watched it. It was a great documentary. <laughs> Thank you. I watched yeah. it on Amazon Prime. I loved it. What's this with the prostitute with Harry Reid? I know there was sh- something in the movie Casino about the because this this beautiful tall blonde girl in the movie up in his room <laughs> taking off her dress. That's you know, and 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 the, 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 yeah. So, what was the deal? Because I know that Smothers, Dick Smothers, played Harry Reid. That was supposed to be that character, right? right. Yeah, and and you know the the thing about Harry Reid is there's been a lot of discussion about whether he was. Uh, Bought and paid for by the mob at the time, and, and he had a really powerful position. Now, now, in his defense, he did work really hard to get Lefty Rosenthal banned from the casino and from inside and working in the casino. Uh, on the other hand, you know, there was a lot of other things. Lefty Rosenthal wasn't the only thing going on. Nick Savella had his whole stream of skim coming in from the uh, Tropicana, too. And his guy, his mole at the Tropicana, was just like Lefty. He had a felony conviction. He should not have been working there. And he was he was slicking by, claiming he was the manager of the Lido show, a guy named Joe Augusto. So he, they, Harry, you know whether he was corrupt or not. Now, my good friend Bill Owsley, uh, FBI agent who was a case agent on that whole case, would allege that Harry Reid was in their pocket because they had a name for him. His name was Clean Face on the wiretaps, and they, they proved that beyond a ra- you know, shadow of a doubt, Clean Face was Harry Reid. And he said, if they had a name for you like that, then it was like a code name, then more than likely you were their guy in some manner. Everybody else that they had a code name like that for was their guy, like the rabbi was Alan Dorfman, for example. And... Uh, uh, all of a sudden, I've lost the rest of them. There are several others. Uh, they had a nickname right. for every guy that was important. Right, right. They didn't want anybody to pick up his name. Right. Mm-hmm. So that that you know that is kind of the strongest evidence that the prostitute. I know they. He was he was also trying to Lefty was also trying to blackmail the new governor, uh, uh, who was just Bob List, who had been the attorney general and been all over Lefty trying to get him kicked out of the casino. And he got elected governor, and during that election, he uh, he told uh, Joe Augusto that he was going to get a prostitute to sign an affidavit that this guy had uh, Bob List had slept with her, or he oh. had slept with him. So, uh, uh, you know, I don't know. That's the one famous famous line. Nick Savella, old school guy, more sophisticated than than all the rest of them put together. I think sometime he said, you know, he's going to get a, a a punta to do what? He said that. Went out with high button shoes, man. <laughs> so, 
That's a classic line, boy, by my boss. I love it. Hey, guys, by the way, uh, if you're just tuning in, hit the like button, smash it, get the algorithms to send this thing out. Go and look in the details down below, and you'll find a couple of links. There's one to, uh, to Gary's channel and uh, Gangland Wire. There's also a link to, uh, to Red Wimette's uh, 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 um, website, so you could buy a book uh, if you'd like from him. Gary, do you have a website? I forgot to ask you. Do you have a website where you sell your books? Uh, yeah, everything I've got, Gangland Wire. You just start running Gangland Wire, Gary Jenkins. You'll get the podcast, the website. You get everything I do under that one name. Ganglandwire.com. Hey, Keith is one of the persons that tried. He couldn't make comments. Now he's on. <laughs> no. There you go. So if you guys want to just take a look at the uh, the bottom of the screen there, and you will see uh, Gangland Wire. Uh, you guys can go there, and uh, that's where you guys can pick up uh, Gary Jenkins and the rest of his, uh, you know, his materials. So, or check out the description and go subscribe to his channel. Make sure you subscribe to his channel. Let's see the numbers go up over there, right, Gary? Yeah, right. I mean, <laughs> all right. I did audio for a long time, and I finally got into this video after COVID started because I was doing so many uh, uh, Zoom calls, and so like that. This video is pretty cool. I can do both now. Yeah, there you go. And you know what? People like to see faces. Yeah, you know, I listen to podcasts and I'm like, I wonder what that guy looks like. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, Don Chichia de Porzalo, Philip Dun uh, Dilberg uh, just got Red's book. See, Red, Red sells a ton of books off of it. He does. Crazy. He sells a ton of books. He does. He does. Uh, Don Chichia de Porzalo. Uh, this is for Gary. While listening to the Sevilla wiretapes, did you ever hear anything about Chicago Heights and Sam Guzino? Uh, sorry, not, uh, does not ring a bell. There's a lot of wiretaps. I've got a, a stack of uh, of transcripts. It's about, I would say, about that high, about a foot high. I've got that many wiretaps, and there's a lot of them with Alan Dorfman that Nick wasn't on that I haven't really looked at it very closely. So Joey Ayupa says that he'd love to hear the old mafia wiretaps, especially <laughs> the, the wiretaps, especially the ones. Uh, that little Al was hidden in the tailor shop, the one called Little Al. Are, you, are, yeah. those, are, are your wiretaps or the ones you listen to? I know they're they're made by the government, so aren't they public domain? Is there a place that they can get them? Well, a little bit of an explanation there. I found out how to do this. So, and, and tell Joey Iupa there, we never got him on the wire. Never got <laughs> Joey on the wire. They should have on a microphone, but he didn't walk up to the second floor where the microphone was that day. Anyhow, uh, uh, to get a wiretap, there's a special law called Title III under the, uh, in the U.S. Code. So we always call them a Title III or a T3 a wiretap. So that's really, it's, it's like grand jury testimony. It's totally secret until it's, uh, it's made public in a court of law as an exhibit. So all the wiretaps that I was able to get were, uh, a, uh, uh, were, had been placed in as evidence during the skim trials. And then the Bureau keeps track of them and, and hangs on to them. Then to get them, you don't do a regular Freedom of Information Act request. What you have to do is file a motion in the court, in the federal court, and, and ask for a court order to order the FBI to give them to you. And then you've got to depend on the U.S. attorney not opposing your order because if they oppose your order, you're probably dead. Now, I had it pretty well wired here in Kansas City because I knew everybody and had a couple of FBI's working with me. We went to the U.S. attorney and said, this is what we're trying to do. We know where these ta tapes are and the transcripts, so uh, we're going to file this motion, and, and they didn't oppose it, so they uh, they granted that. That's how hard it is to get wiretap information. Anytime you see that real wiretap information, it's been played in court somewhere. And it, it, some of them, there might be like a lawyer may have got hold of them uh, who was a defense lawyer and released them, but you don't see much like that. Okay. Um so Scott H has a question here about a documentary. Um, he said he saw a documentary where they killed the little brother for just being a hippie. And I think he's talking about the Spiro brothers. Is that right? Right. Brothers uh, against brothers. And, yeah. and just for those of you who may not know the Spiro brothers, um, let's, let's throw a couple of them up here so that you guys can get a, get a view here. That's Carl. Carl Spiro. Then you have Mike Spiro Mike. and then Joe Spiro. Yes. And that's that's the Spiro brothers, right? Right. Okay. That's the three that were still alive. There was a fourth one, Nick Spiro, who was 
long dead for up back in 19, no, uh, what, 70 or se I think 70 before any of this war started with the Spiro brothers. They killed the oldest brother, uh, Carl. So, and that's who, Scott. Hi, Scott. How you doing? I, that's, Scott's my friend from down in Florida. I hooked up with him when I was down there on vacation recently. That's awesome. Scott's a great guy. We had a good time. He is. So, anyhow, uh, his brothers against brothers, the Savella Spiro War, and the oldest brother, Nick, was a good earner. He was a great earner, and, and they liked him, but he he also, he was a, a maverick. He, he reveled in being a maverick in the outfit, and Nick Savella did not like mavericks. He didn't like people with long hair. He didn't like people with beards. This is like 1968, 69, 70. So he had the, the big, the, the, the what do you call that, the generation gap, those of us who were like 21, 22, 23 during those years. We remember that if you grew your hair out long and you worked in like the Ford plant, like I did early on, man, they were, they were all over you. <laughs> I called you all kinds of names. So, so Nick Savella, I mean, Nick Spiro grew his hair out long, wore kind of bell bottom pants, pants and flowery clothes and, and a real flamboyant guy. And, and now I, I don't, he wasn't killed just for being a hippie. That was part of it but he was a real good earner uh, but i think what he was doing was he was he was kind of starting his own thing because his brother his three other brothers ended up continuing starting trying to start their own thing and telling people they were moving in on the sabella so that's really why nick sparrow got killed weren't they so, kind of young turks that they were coming up yeah they were young turks Here's what here's an interesting little comment he made to an FBI agent. I got this out of a Freedom of Information Request Act. FBI agent finds Nick Sparrow and he would talk. He also would talk to him. Nick Savella, he didn't want you even looking at a federal agent. If they came up to talk to you, he would be mad if you actually engaged him in pleasantries of the day. And so Nick Sparrow was a guy that would talk to him and they interviewed him. And I think he was working on a truck dock. He was into the Teamsters. He was uh, but he was using the truck docks to set up scores is what he was doing, his connection with the Teamsters and working on the dock. And an agent came to him and he said, you know, how come you're not joining the organization, the, the, the mob here in Kansas City? Because it was pretty well known he had refused to become a member when he was younger. And he said, you know, he said, these guys here, he said, uh, he said, they use you up. He said, they treat you just like a job strap. They just stretch and stretch and stretch you until there's nothing left and then throw you away. And, and so, and he was, all of his brothers were like that. They were mavericks and refused to kind of join in and, and listen to the hierarchy and fit in with them. They were going to do their own thing. They the did Spiro, do their own thing to the end. <clears throat> uh, Benny Fazio, the Spiros are Greek, right? No, S-P-E-R-O. They were Italian. Oh. Spiros, Italian. they're Italian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Joey Ayupa, Shorty Spillarello. Who killed him? Chicago Joe wants to know who killed him and how. Nick. Yes. Well, uh, uh, we don't know for sure. Actually, they did. They uh, got him alone in his car. He was a partier every night. He was real well liked in the bar scene and was out every night partying and had a ton of different girlfriends. And, and and so he's out drinking one night and and about four o'clock that morning, a local policeman up north of the river in a suburb finds his yellow Cadillac convertible sitting on a side street and, and you know, nobody around. And so he goes up to investigate. And, and, and I think he probably ran the license number. And by then everybody knew who the Spiros were back then. And, and somebody looked in the trunk and, and there he was, his dead body was in the trunk. Now, was that across the river in Kansas? Kansas? Uh, in this, actually the, the Missouri river divides Kansas city, uh, uh, and can't Missouri and Kansas, but it also divides a southern part of Kansas City with the northern part of Kansas City. And all the mob guys moved to the north of the river after they moved out of Little Italy. So <laughs> they all lived up there in the compound in, in north of the river. So just finding the body in the trunk north of the river, it wasn't that far from Nick Savella's house, to be quite honest. It was probably a mile from crow flies from his house. So that was a, that was like another sign. You know, they don't do anything without leaving some kind of a signal. You know, hey, we did this, and, and that's, you know, pay attention that we did this. And, you know, probably, you know, if one were to speculate at the time, his underboss guy named Tuffy DeLuna and, and, and his kind of compadre, uh, Carl Charlie Mortina, uh, was a... Martina was a real deadly, quiet guy that you really never knew what he was up to. I know Red knew guys like this. 
they didn't they didn't speak to anybody about anything except their real close compadres and and martina was that guy he was a deadly guy nobody ever made a case on him i don't think until he got caught up in the skim but before that he hadn't had a case on him since he was a young kid so i i would say between those two you know they probably they would they would have done it they would have had to get him alone some way because nick sparrow was a tough dude and, and he would he would fight they, they had to like get him put at ease and uh, you know somebody in the back seat there was somebody in the back seat he was in the, in the driver's seat and somebody in the passenger seat they they popped him like that so so this is the biggest question on this channel that we everybody who tunes in is always like does the chicago outfit still exist that's the <laughs> yeah, big question I, I no it the, is I see that and, and then they the kansas city they come on the tour yeah is there still a mob in las vegas yeah, okay yeah. What about Kansas City? Jim Yeager's uh, asking. Yeah, I get that asked that question all the time, and I've got my sources out there. I don't, uh, I don't really get into it too much. I, this, this is what I can say. Is uh, at least until recently, we're just getting ready to get uh, legalized sports gambling. We've had a book all along uh, in Kansas City, uh, so you know, and and a guy that seems to be running that book is an old Bob guy that that's kind of was a young guy back then. And, and he's been, I'd say he was still running the book. And so we've had a book and, and uh, we've got, you know, we had one young guy that had a crew who was the son of an old Bob guy. And, and he, uh, he was, he, his little crew was robbing drug dealers for a while. And I know they robbed one gambler and killed him, but that's all speculation. But in, in my professional opinion, I, kn I know from the informants they were robbing drug dealers. Drug dealers don't usually uh, complain. <laughs> but uh, uh, then this uh, gambler was robbed and killed. And, and the, the, one of the kids that was part of this young guy's crew was walking out of a place where this gambler left and they caught him on a camera walking out right behind him. So, you know, they killed him. Uh, and uh, some of these guys will meet at a restaurant periodically and you'll see them together periodically meeting. Uh, they'll go to a particular joint up north of the river, sign the same place. Now, are they just good friends from back in the day? Are they still got some action going on? I I'm not really privy to any of that. They lost, you know, they lost their Teamsters money their Teamsters connection, they lost the casino money. Uh, there's there's always going to be boosters out there that have some stuff that you can fence for them. There's always going to be that. And, uh, there's probably, I know one of them has put money into the drug business. Uh, so, uh, but they're they're pretty slick. They're, they're, they are they do not uh, they don't draw any attention at all. They learned something from Nick Sabella. Um, so a couple of great questions. Uh, Keith Osborne, Anthony's say, Italian Ice in a KC, a, a prior or current mob hangout? I love Anthony's. That's my favorite Italian restaurant. Anthony's is downtown, close to downtown, right between downtown and what we call the North End or Little Italy in the city market. Kind of general area, run by probably the third generation of an Italian family. Great food, always run a good restaurant, uh, good help. Uh, I, I've been in there a lot myself. The, the owners and the owner's family, they were never known to be involved in any action. They just ran a good restaurant and a lot of, a lot of mob guys would go there. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you couldn't say it was a mob place or a hangout particularly, but I, I walked in there one time and there was about every mob bookie in the city sitting around one big table. But, you know, hey, they probably just were celebrating something and, and wanted to go to, said, hey, let's go to Anthony's and have some uh, lasagna or something. So. Yeah. So, you know, that's, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, you're talking about a mob place. Now, like the place we put the wire tower, the bug in, the uh, Billy Capri, it was owned by a guy who had taken a hit for, for being a bookie. And, and and they did all sit there and, and hardly anybody else went into there and, and, except mob guys and mob associates. So that would be what I'd call a mob hangout or a mob location. So Scott H asks, which casinos were controlled by Kansas City as opposed to Chicago? And Chicago had Fremont, Hacienda, uh, Marina, and Stardust. Stardust, yeah. That was the Argent Corporation, Alan Glick's operation. Well, Kansas City, good question, Scott. Kansas City had the Tropicana. They had this guy named Joe Augusto, who was actually from Sicily and was a guy that had floated below, below the radar 
his entire life. He's like, you know, 60 years old, 55 years old, and he is running the Lido show, but he really has the confidence of the four or five different owners of this Tropicana, and they allow him to hire a guy named uh, Carl Thomas, who had been at the Stardust and skim, running the skim from the Stardust for a while, but couldn't really get along with Lefty. And, and Carl Thomas, and he brought in his whole crew. Uh, and we know this because Carl Thomas and Joe Gosto came back to Kansas City, and we got uh, uh, tapes of he and Augusto discussing skimming from casinos in Las Vegas. And, and Carl Thomas had been doing this since he was a young man. Uh, so so the, they, uh, they totally had the... Uh, uh, the Tropicana wired up. They're getting about forty grand a month because when we took them off, we got two months skim, and it was eighty grand in cash. How, how much? How much? Uh, somebody just asked, how much was it a month that they were skimming? We said we figured forty a month when it was really rocking and rolling because they took them down with two two months of packages or sandwiches. They called them sandwiches on the wire. Took them down with two months worth, and it was eighty grand. Wow, two months worth. So they said that Chicago was doing three hundred thousand a month, but I don't know if that was sixties, seventies, eighties. Probably in the seventies, all during seventies. Seventies a peak, probably. Yeah. And okay. they probably were because they had four casinos they were drawing from. Plus, they had to share with Milwaukee, Cleveland, and Kansas City. Right, which that's that's interesting. That there was two separate streams of skim going out of Vegas, right. and they were just going different directions. The money, but the money was all traveling to those guys. Right. And, Whether and, it went through Kansas City first, then to Chicago, Chicago to Kansas, it didn't matter. It was going and, around. And, and see, when it came to Kansas City, Nick Savella didn't really have to share it with anybody because he developed that all on his own. But he did share with Joy Ayupa. He, he did give him, it was in the five figures amount. I'm trying to remember one little package was like going to be, I, I, it indicated in the notes that it was going to be 20000 Think, but it wasn't regular he just would would kick him some every once in a while because we were like under chicago and and, and so nick knew to kick up to iupa personally and and that would keep everybody happy so um kirby thomas it's good to see you jim yeager uh, has uh, gary have you met john johnny joe scortino or Shortino. peter yeah. I'm sorry, Shortino? Yeah, I followed him around a lot. What about <laughs> never, Peter Simone? I, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah? I never met him, but I followed him around a lot. They're still around. They're still alive. Uh, would you would you agree, Gary, that uh, this is from Victor Hubler. Would you agree that basically Nick and them didn't like to kill Lefty uh, fast enough? Seems like a few problems they would have had uh, gone away if they had whacked Lefty. Well, left is a whole nother story in, in some way, but you know, he was a top echelon informant at the time and, and nobody from the FBI will talk about this at all. That's, that's a huge no, no. Somebody well, did. They have, it out. They have but, now, they have they have now they, but, but they leaked it out kind of sub Rosa to that Jane Ann Morrison, who was a reporter for the Las Vegas review journal. And, and, you know, like my friend Bill Owsley, you mentioned that to him and, and he just like, he just see a darkness come over his face when he, when he says somebody did that. And there's a reason for that is if a, a guy helps you out and you promise him, you'll never reveal that. And then even though, even though he's dead, you reveal it, but his family then can pay. Uh, I mean, they'll be ostracized. These are small little uh, uh, insular communities that these guys live in many times and they're married into each other. So you start leaking out who's going to become a, a top echelon informant, a really good informant if uh, if they leak it out. So nobody's ever really leaked it. I mean, nobody's ever officially said it. One agent leaked it out there, but I know who it is too because he did not like Lefty. Anyhow, uh, uh, so as far as killing him fast enough, Lefty was given real deep throat back behind the scenes information. He wasn't really given it anything that was real actionable that they could take action on. He was kind of keeping them up on these informants, you know, some guys just keep you up on this guy and that guy. So you give them that deep background to kind of keep you straight. And, and, and because they never intercepted any of the skim or, or really got anything out of lost out of the stardust and that stream of skim. They, uh, somebody set them up one time and, and they took off a guy with a, a bag of Italian cookies. And, and I think that was Lefty's little joke on myself. I'm just 
guessing on that, but they never really, the only way they made that uh, uh, case on IUPA and Cleveland and Chicago, I mean, uh, Chicago and uh, Milwaukee was first of all, the trop fell. They turned Joe Augusto. And, and when they turned Joe Augusto, they convicted this Carl Thomas. Well, Carl Thomas had been their man on the inside at the Stardust. So then he was able to turn around and testify about Chicago and Alan Dorfman, and because he had a lot of direct connections with Alan Dorfman, that's Carl Thomas there. Uh, he had a lot of direct connections with Alan Dorfman, had been skimming for these guys for a long time. And so then he turned on Chicago, and then same time, if you remember, Angelo Leonardo, the boss of Cleveland, was turned out of some drug case he had, and so he testified against them. Uh, 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 what's his name? Jimmy the uh, the Weasel, Fradiano. He came in. He testified at that trial. Hell, they brought in Ken Ito from Chicago. He testified at that trial about the you know the Chicago outfit and the different connections and and so you put all that together and then with the wiretaps and then you put all that together, then they were able to get those those convictions. And Lefty Lefty was never even interviewed uh, uh, officially. He was never taken to a grand jury. He was never indicted. He just walked after they tried to blow him up. But he just walked. How, how could you not know this guy wasn't an informant when all this huge case comes down and he's not even interviewed, let alone taken to a given a grand jury subpoena? So uh, I don't know if, if they'd have whacked Lefty earlier. I don't think it made a difference because it was made off the uh, wiretaps on the trop, which then led him to Carl Thomas and, and Angelo Leonardo was a separate a witness that came in, then you got all these wiretaps, you know, plus Dorfman and Spilatro up in uh, Dorfman's office and Lombardo were talking about the skim and the teamsters and all that. So it's a huge case in which one person was just one little cog in the machine. Uh, it, it had to all come together. Oh, so somebody, somebody just asked here of what your thoughts are on Fat Herbie Blitzstein. <laughs> And did you like Oscar Goodman? <laughs> Oscar Goodman. I, you know, Platt Herbie came along kind of after my time and was not really, he was kind of a periphery character, I think, back then. Was, and, you know, he was with Colada, I'm not Colada, but he was with Spilatro. See, Spilatro, he was not really into the skim. He just from a distance, he couldn't go into the casinos. Uh, a lot of that shit with casino where he's like going and talking to Lefty Rosenthal. I don't really buy that. Maybe he did, but. That was all based on Nick Pelleggi talking to Lefty Rosenthal, who uh, uh, would not know the truth if it spit in his face. So, you know, I, I don't know about Herbie, but uh, but what was that? What was the other part of that question? Uh, so the other part was, what do you oh, think? Uh, Oscar, Oscar Goodman. Goodman. Oh, Oscar Goodman. I, I, I had to sit in the, I, one of the scariest I ever was testifying. This was after the skim. We were running a surveillance on the other Savala brother that's not very well known because he was in the penitentiary on another case during the skim named Tony Savala or Tony Ripe, they called him. And Tony Ripe was running the scam. It, it was what we call a gray market drug scam. He was, uh, he had a, and a couple other people were involved in this and they were buying pharmaceuticals from a, a supplier claiming that they were going to a nursing home and you could get a big discount if they were going to a nursing home. Well, they didn't really have a nursing home. They were just going to a uh, warehouse and then they were shipping them out to a guy out in Nevada who had several uh, privately, you know, his own pharmacies, uh, had four, owned four or five pharmacies and he was buying all this stuff. And so they were making this extra cut because they got this big discount using this uh, uh, nursing home scam. And, and so I saw, uh, I went into a restaurant because they're running a the wire and they called the office and said, we need somebody down. Pete Tamburello's Marty's Barbecue right away because Tony Ripe's meeting this guy and something's going to happen. We don't know what it is. So uh, I grabbed this other guy and said, come on, we're going to go eat. I'll pay for it. So we run down there and we're eating barbecue and and pretty soon Tony Ripe comes in and, and this kid is already in there that we hadn't paid attention to, just a little young Peckerwood kid. And, and Ripe sits straight down there with him and, and he starts... You know, we're kind of like looking over and watching what they're doing. And, you know, these white collar crimes are not like working an armed robber or a burglar or anything. And, and they're not doing anything. <laughs> and so finally, Wright takes out, let's see, was it? Uh, uh, no, this kid took out a checkbook and he wrote a check and tore it out and handed it to Wright. 
So then they left. We get out and call the FBI and say, okay, here's what happened. And, and then about a year later, they, it all goes down. And that check was, was important and needed to, to show that this kid handed it directly to Wright. So I ha I'm going to have to testify because I'm the guy that saw him writing on something looked like a check and turn it out. So the night before, the, uh, the day before, the U.S. Attorney's Office got me in and they just hammered me with questions. And, you know, I mean, they were derogatory. They were preparing me because Oscar Goodman was going to you know, cross-examine me. Like, shit, I go into the courtroom that day and it's this old-timey courtroom back in the 30s and, and in the federal courthouse. And I'll walk in and that whole gallery, I mean, the whole you know audience is filled. And one side is about 20 different guys and, and some gals from the Sabella crew. And I thought, oh man. So I go in, sit down and, and, and you know, they swear me in and, and the U.S. attorney asked me about this transaction. So then Oscar Goodman said, well, you're a witness, Mr. Goodman. So he gets up and, and he asked me like two kind of, I don't even know what the questions were. They were so, in a, you know, they didn't mean anything to me. And I answered him. He said, nothing further, your honor. I was like, oh man. <laughs> but he, you know, he's a real competent guy. Uh, uh, I understand. I, I've read his biography, which is pretty good. He's an interesting guy. And there's Oscar and Tony Splatro. He he uh, he he had a lot of secrets, but he was cool. I got a wiretap with Nick Savella talking to him, trying to find Lefty Rosenthal to get a message to him. And <laughs> Oscar is slick. He is cool. He said a lot, but he didn't say a word. He didn't say anything. And they were, you know, like buddy, buddy, because Nick had, had used him as a lawyer. He defended Nick and something. Uh, and they knew, yeah, obviously knew each other really well. So, uh, so I, he just, I, I have a certain lawyer. I'm a lawyer myself now, and I have a certain lawyer's uh, admiration for uh, Oscar Goodman. I don't see it that he's any kind of enemy of the uh, you know, law and order or the uh, legal system at all. He, he's just doing his job in a really skillful manner. So, so Gary, uh, let me ask you, there's a lot of comments on the side. We're going to put them up on the screen in a minute here. And, um, <clears throat> and Joe Collada, uh, Joe Collada, thanks for uh, tuning in. Glad that you're enjoying the show today. Uh, everybody else, Chicago Joe's laughing at Peckerwood. <laughs> I haven't heard that word used in a long time. But then again, Gary, I want you guys to realize that Gary's from Kansas City, but that's not in Kansas City. That's actually in Missouri. And yeah. I hear the people on the radio in Missouri calling it Missouri. Missouri <laughs> yeah. and Missouri, right? Yeah. You know what? I was in Missouri, and I said, it's the show me state. I said, show me how to get the hell out of here. All right. <laughs> you know what's fun to do in Kansas City? Pack your crap. Go to Vegas. Right. <laughs> listen to that, Red. Listen to that. <laughs> no, listen to this. Check this out, Gary. Because I talked to Red about this. I haven't asked you about it. But everywhere in the world, they're tearing down statues, okay? Because that guy's bad, and this guy was this, and that guy was that. Yeah. It seems like they're mostly tearing down male statues, if you ask me, which I think isn't right. I think that it should be equal. You know what I mean? But, but here in Vegas, we got a monument built to a mobster. We got Bugsy Siegel, a monument. And now, now we have a statue of Tony Spilatro, a bronze statue in town. Of what do you think of that, Gary? Are you kidding me? That's a, I guess it's a pretty good public relations ploy. It must be some kind of okay. advertisement for a, concert, a casino. Now look, Oscar, now look. Oscar Goodman has it in his steakhouse. Oh, oh okay. well, that makes sense. That makes so, sense. Oscar has Tony a statue. Tony paid for it. <laughs> Pretty years. <laughs> Tony paid for it. That's hilarious. Yeah, really. He did too. <laughs> everybody, everybody, now check this out. Because what the hell? A, a, really, a statue? To Tony Spilatro. So I made a video. I had to go do it, Gary. I ran down to Oscars. I made a video because I'm like, everybody's saying this. Everybody's saying to me, they're like, you know, Adam, you keep playing clips of Frank Collada. You're trying to ride on his name while he's dead. What's the matter with you? Listen, guys, Oscar Goodman's my mentor. That's why. <laughs> That's why I made a video. Check this out. Ready? Listen up, guys. This is this is fun. This is going to go up uh, later on. And guys, hit the smash button. Hit the like button. We'll put comments up in a second as soon as the uh, video is done. Listen and watch this, guys. You're going to enjoy this. <laughs> hey, guys. We're here at the Plaza Hotel. Can you hear And uh, right above me is Oscar's Steakhouse. Take a look. It sticks out. It has a wonderful view of... Fremont Street. Well, it had until they 
until they built those zip lines right there. We're gonna head into the plaza, take you upstairs to Oscar's, uh, to Oscar's Steakhouse, where there is a brand new statue put up of Tony Spilatro and Oscar Goodman. Let's go. I thought maybe it was life-size, but it's not life-size, I guarantee you that. And um, we are walking into this place right here. And there you have it, Oscar's Steakhouse. And as you can see, there are a lot of pictures of Oscar, pictures all over the wall. As you all know, Oscar Goodman defended Tony Spilatro, and that is, that is Tony Spilatro and Oscar Goodman. Now, granted, it definitely is not life-size. I am right now standing next to Tony Spilatro, and he is damn near six foot tall. <laughs> so the little guy, I don't think they're calling him the little guy here. And I gotta say, Oscar, with a very serious look on his face here. Extremely serious look. There's Oscar, there's Tony, there's the statue. And of course, here's Fremont Street. For giggles, let's see. This is me next to Oscar Goodman. Oscar Goodman is bigger than Penn Gillette. Oscar's probably six foot eight. Hope you guys enjoyed this short video. And if you're in town in Las Vegas, be sure to uh, visit Oscar's uh, Steakhouse and um, we'll come take a look. You guys can get a picture or whatnot if you want. There's souvenirs you can buy from the plaza. It's all right here. So enjoy guys, have a great day. I just want to throw this out there. Oscar owes me a steak now, okay? Yes. You know how many freaking people are going to go there to see that statue now? All right. You, normally, I got to charge people for that, but you can yeah. just one on me, Oscar. <laughs> oh, wow. It's great to – everybody who's in here, it looks like everybody's having a good time. Julian is a uh, he's a, um, a bar back over at the Pepper Mill. I have to say hi next time I'm in there, Julian. We try and go there often. Uh, Oscar Goodman is mobsters, what Johnny Cochran was to O.J. Simpson. <laughs> okay, I guess you could say that. I mean, he kind of had a, he got a Tony out of a lot of, a lot of problems, let's just call him, right? <laughs> uh, what is he, 100 man. years old? I, Oscar's up there. He's like 88 or 89, I want to say. He's, he's, I, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's 82, 81, but I just saw the other day. I know it's in the, he's in the 80s. So, um, Dave Fox wants to know, Gary. Does the Galloping Goose Motorcycle Club have any connections to the Kansas City like the Outlaws do with the Chicago outfit? No, no, they don't. Galloping Goose doesn't. There was another one. Uh, I want to say the L4 Steros or maybe another. I don't know. They used to provide some uh, 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 dancers for strip clubs, a small kind of strip clubs. But, uh, but I, I never really heard of any real strong connection where they might do something together or even get them. They, these guys are a bunch of goons in Kansas City. They, uh, I, can't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't hire them to, to, you know, do anything. So, Gary, we're all over the place because we're in an open forum now. Right. But Frank Ferraro wants to know, did you ever hear any tapes on JFK or Monroe murders? No. Okay. Um, question for Red from Kirby Thomas. Was uh, Tony's cocaine use in his later years, how bad was it? Excessive. excessive very excessive what about drugs in kansas city gary with the mob oh uh you know there was uh 
a couple of the uh, some couple three of their kids ended up with drug problems and, and really bad drug problems. Uh, but as far as investing money in it, they there was a couple different people that that invested money. You know, one guy uh, he was he was a big time fence in Kansas City. And, Name was uh, it was half Italian. He was only half pepper, <laughs> but he was uh, he was investing money in a black heroin cocaine dealer. Uh, we got a uh, when they made a case on the the cocaine dealer. His wife ended up testifying. She said that she saw Junior Bradley give him a like a a trash sack, but like a big grocery sack full of cash money. And it was an, it was really an investment. So they might do something like that. There was another guy who I won't go into, but I, I know he was uh, his name anyhow, but, but I know he had some kind of a cocaine thing going. And I think he had, by the time anybody even knew anything about him doing it, he was just you know, kind of like the, the banker. He was a, a higher echelon guy and wasn't really touching anything. So as far as day-to-day -day basis or, or anybody really run around going, you know, going and making Kilo connections, we got uh, Willie Camasano's grandson with a Kilo uh, in the 90s when cocaine was really rocking and rolling and, and he just bought it from, uh, I don't know if it was a Peckerwood, he just bought it from somebody who wasn't really connected and he didn't have he, he didn't know like operation. He was going to try to figure out he was involved in a lot of clubs and uh, hang out and a, uh, a, uh, like a, a, a bouncer and stuff like that. So, uh, we just didn't really see any real strong. Nick Savella was pretty strong against it and, and everybody pretty well fell in line with what he wanted to do. Um, <clears throat> I can answer um, Lewis Cole right away. No. <laughs> yeah, that's the short answer, Lewis. Sorry, Arthur, not. Arthur Stewell, have any of you guys uh, eaten at Oscar's Steakhouse? If so, how's the food? I, I haven't. I don't. You you haven't read, Gary? No? No. I, I didn't. I was out there once and hung out in the bar with some people and talked to them, but I, I didn't. I never did eat there. Oh, huh, okay. You ever come out? You ever come out? We'll go eat. I will. That'd be, that'd be nice. I'll let um, you and, know. And, and I'll tell you what, I'll tell you if the food's good, as soon as Oscar invites me there for a free steak for making yeah, a video. He owes you, man. Right? He, he owes me you. at least the steak. He does. So, you know, that's just the right thing to do, Oscar. You know, they say just you do the right thing. You know what I mean? And I, I believe you're going to do the right thing, Oscar. You'd hate to have to come back and give him some bad publicity, wouldn't you? I sure would hate to go out there and eat a steak on my own and talk about how bad it was. How bad it was. Especially if it's going to cost me, you know what I mean? Man, you, uh, you, you catch on quick, Adam. <laughs> hey, look, I had Frank as a friend for a while. You <laughs> yeah, know you I mean? did. You did. And Red. <laughs> And red, yeah. Red didn't fall off the turnip truck yesterday, did he? <laughs> that's right. Nah, that's right. Um, well, let's see here. The the uh, uh, Arthur Stewell did Tony Spilatro deal with biker gangs when he was in Vegas? No, no clue. Oh, oh. No idea. No. I I don't even know about biker gangs being in Vegas. And if they, well, I could say I shouldn't say that because I know there's a Hell's Angels chapter not far from where I live, um, the clubhouse. So it. And I was told about that when I first got here by a friend. But, uh, yeah, I don't know about Tony being involved with any of that. So, uh, guys, once again, if you're just getting in here, hit the like button. we got a room full of people. And uh, go down in the description if you want to check out uh, Gary's channel. Uh, go over there. Subscribe to his channel. Uh, you subscribe over there. Over here, we prescribe. So that's, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but go to his channel and subscribe to it. Um, and go go check it out. Lewis Cole wants to know uh, what uh, what you, uh, Gary's uh, role was in the skim in Vegas. And, and Gary Gary listened to all the wiretaps because he was a detective for Kansas City in the intelligence unit, right? Right. Yeah. So <clears throat> he was boots um, on the ground. <laughs> boots on the ground. Yeah, boots on the ground. And, the fly and there's the a wall. wall. I'll tell you what, there's a wealth of knowledge, too, on Gary's channel. And I've listened to some of it. I know Red, Red over here listens to a lot more of it. Okay, yeah. He's probably listened listen to all to of Gary's Gary stuff. So. I listen to everything Red, Gary does. He's Red Red was my first guest a long time ago, five years ago or so. I was, he was one of my first, he was my first remote guest, actually. Oh, Red was? Okay. 
Thank you, Gary. And thank you for being an honest cop. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> All, all Red knew was dirty cops. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, in Chicago. <laughs> Sad but true, I think. There had to be some good ones up there. Sure. Um, Victor Hubler agrees. You're a great knowledgeable. Your podcast is fantastic. Uh, Victor Hubler. Um, sorry. Uh, John Calgiros or Calgiros or Calgiros. Calieros. Uh, Calieros? I'd say Calieros. Calieros. Um, uh, no, no, Gary, I, what about New York mob? Any involvement in, Cal in, in Kansas City? I never knew any. We, we had a, a rumor once that Ch Sonny Francese had some connection with a credit card company that was doing some hinky things out in and actually was in a suburb of Kansas City, but uh, I, I never, uh, I, you know, that was a, that was the extent of it. Uh, was uh, 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 Keith Helton wants to know was Flick and Lefty recorded by threatened by or threatened by Sevilla? It's been denied by Lefty. You know uh, uh, the the direct. I, I only have the transcript. Funny how the audio disappeared. Hmm. I only had the transcript where Nick talked to Lefty directly. And, and he did not threaten him at all. He did say, you got to cool it, man. Just cool it. Because he, he, you know, he wanted him to stop that stuff with the gaming commission. That was a main thing. This was all about business and keeping things on the down low. Nick Savella was not the kind of guy that would get on a phone and threaten anybody more than just cool it. Kiddo wants to know what happened to the guy that told you about the stolen and construction equipment. Oh my God, that's a that's a good story, dude. That is, uh, Kiddo, uh, you didn't know what you stepped into there. <laughs> this guy was a good guy, and he, but he was like a working guy had a a, a, a tow shop tow shop and, and a body shop, and and back then, this early seven, or let's see, no, not early. Um, uh, 77 78 and it seemed like he was older than me even then i was probably 35 36 and i thought he was around 50 even and he, he was a, a chain smoker and he had emphysema back then i mean yeah, and so you know he he kind of gets involved with sparrow the kind of the short end of the story was carl sparrow had stolen a bulldozer he had a little construction company and building basements and, and he stole a bulldozer he had a low boy already because I'd seen him driving this low boy around. He had his own bulldozer, but he stole a bulldozer from a construction site and he was taking it down to sell to a guy down the middle part of the state. And uh, something happened to his truck that was, uh, they slid off in the ditch in the end or something. And, and he got hold of this guy who he knew had a tow truck and called him and said, hey, can you meet me down here? And I'll, I'll take care of you. So my guy went down there and he was not an informant at the time. He only became a poor informant because he thought I was gonna, I would know about this when I approached him. Didn't like you a month, develop him? Didn't yeah, you develop I, I him? Approached, yeah, I approached him like a year, or not even a year, probably two or three months later after this. I didn't even know about this uh, that he had done this, but he had this guilty conscience, and he thought I knew about this, and, and so I just kept going back and and grooming him and talking to him, and he didn't want to tell me anything, but he knew a lot of stuff. Uh, and mainly about connections and who was who and, and what they were doing now and the used car business and some other scams that were going along. And finally, he said, well, he said, I'm just have to tell you. He said, uh, and he starts telling me about this time that he went down and towed this truck out and got this bulldozer on the road again. And he said, I know it was stolen. And, and it went to somebody down there in the central part of the state. So, uh, you know, and he become and he, after he tells me that, I kind of got him now. So he was the kind of guy, if I had, I had a guy that was, uh, had a body shop and some hinky things going on. So I'd go to my guy, John, and I'd say, hey, go to this body shop and tell me what's going on. So he'd run over there and just hang around and talk and see what was going on. So he was, he was a good guy and he'd help me with all those kinds of things for quite a while. And then I drifted away. I got promoted and went back to patrol. And I didn't even know what happened to him. I figured he was long dead. So I talk about him in that movie, Brothers Against Brothers. And I get a call from his wife 
And and they had, I don't know, they saw me in the paper or something. They got my phone number and they had some legal situation. I'm a lawyer. They had some legal situation they wanted to talk to me about. I said, John's still alive? Oh, yeah, we're out here in this nursing home and our grandson and blah, blah. I'm going, oh, my God. So I said, put him on the phone. So I told him, I said, I did this. And, and I didn't say your last name, but I didn't say your first name because I figured you were long dead. Nah, he said, I don't worry about it. Fuck it. I don't care. And uh, so that's whatever happened to my friend, John. <laughs> Thanks for asking that question, kiddo. <laughs> Much appreciated. What was Corky like? Matt, Matt Larson wants to know. Matt's Larson. Oh, Cor Corky was, uh, was not a very friendly guy. <laughs> I think unless you're his pal. Uh, he, he was... Uh, he kind of a partier, like to go out in the clubs, and and he was hail fellow well met among his his crew, but he was not going to talk to you, and he had a, had this really hot temper, uh, so he basically stayed away from court, and and uh, unless you really had some reason to talk to him, he wasn't going to be friendly at all. He was he was just that kind of guy. But I, I remember one of the first times I followed him all by myself. I was working at night, and I saw him drive down the street. So I just followed him. He pulls in this joint. It was it was kind of a swinging singles kind of joint. So I go in, sit up the bar, and there's old Cork with all these young people. <laughs> and, and there's a real hot young gal, probably 21 or 22, and he's seeing Cork her out dancing. So I just hang out at the bar, and finally, about the time the place closed, Closes and I get out and I go out and get my car and I see Court come out and I see her come out and and he follows her. They go over to an apartment building about four or five blocks away and disappear inside the building. So that's what kind of guy Cork was. Huh. It wasn't Corky, it was Cork. Right. It was Cork. He did not like Cork. Corky. Didn't like Corky. Do you think you'll interview Mickey Scars again? Mikey yeah, Scars? I, I get that question a lot. I, I've tried. Uh, I, I can get, I, I don't really try to talk to him one-on-one. -on -one. I don't want to push him. I, I figure what I've got, I got, and, and I'm happy with it. He, he really had, gave me one hell of an interview. I mean, he gave me a blow by blow description of the night he was made. And he was made by Sammy the bull at the same time John Gotti Jr. was made. And he said, the reason Sammy the bull, who was Gotti's underboss at the time then, it's after Castellano was killed. He said the reason Sammy the Bull made him was because uh, uh, Gotti felt like it didn't look good for him to be preside over the making ceremony of his son. And, and so uh, he just was a well, dynamite interview. He was a good guy. I really liked him, and, and I'd like to do more with him. I've made a couple of kind of runs on him to see if he'd be interested, and, and he, he always tells me he's really not interested right now. Maybe I can get him back one of these days. Gary, Don Ciccio di Porzalo wanted to know, wasn't there an agent that infiltrated the Sevillas family that was half Italian in his mother's side and was able to speak Italian? Uh, you know, that's, uh, they didn't infiltrate him. There was a guy, uh, uh, Lee Flossie, who actually was, was full-blood Sicilian. And, and, and he spoke Sicilian, not Italian particularly, but he spoke Sicilian because he was a huge help in translating some of the wiretaps because they did some of them all in Sicilian. Uh, but that's probably who he's thinking of because uh, Lee's got a, uh, they hated him. They hated him. They felt like he was a traitor, of course. Oh, boy. And uh, Jackie Cerrone, kind of interesting little subject or uh, interesting side story. He told me that he was he transferred to Chicago in the end. His last of his career was spent in Chicago. And, and one of Cerrone's uh, relatives came to him one day, saw him in a courtroom or something and said, hey, he said, you know, why are you you betraying your cousin? You know, what's up with you, your own family? And he said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know, Jackie Cerrone, he's your cousin. And, and then it hit him. He was in law school with Jackie Cerrone's son. And they used to call each other cuz, as many Italians do, at least in Kansas City. In a hey, cuz. Their city. So, hey, cuz. Yeah, they, they, everybody's cuz. Yeah. And we just jokingly called each other cuz. But he said, I, you know, but we didn't really have, nobody really infiltrated the mafia family in Kansas City. Uh, nobody did. It was too small a town. You just yeah. can't, you cannot do it. Plus, the guy was, they made a case on a, a periphery guy and got introduced into the social club and could play cards in there for a while. But but uh, nobody ever really got introduced in. 
Yeah, Bob, Arthur Stoolwell says it's a great interview. Check out Gary's yeah. interview with uh, Mikey Scars, and I'm sure that's on your channel. Yeah. Uh, David, David S., I can tell from your emoji. Adam <laughs> was the boss of Kelsey. He's a fellow Magi. It's good to see you, Dave. I hope you and the missus and the family are doing well. Uh, let me go through a couple more, guys, because we're just coming up to the end of this hour, and it sure as hell didn't feel like an hour to me, which means that's, uh, that means this is a great show. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and Don Ciccio said, that's him, the one that you're talking about that spoke okay. Sicilian. That's the one he was wondering about. Uh, Rick uh, Charlton saw the Illinois told the truckers to stay out. Not corrupt enough for Chicago. <laughs> Guess not. <laughs> um, we, are, uh, um, we have had a great time today. Gary, thank you so much for coming okay. on the show. Good and time. again, again, this is the second time because the first time we did a, a pre- uh, pre-recorded broadcast to yeah. introduce you to who you were and i'm sure you guys i don't know in the comments on the side if you guys want to see gary on again you want more questions you want to prepare some more now that you've heard from him again hit the number one if you never want to see gary on this channel <laughs> oh, again, don't do that don't do that i want you to push the number two <laughs> Oh, well, we got to see go what's going on. Naked, Adam. <laughs> Greg, Greg Hart. Greg, hey, you come on my vlog. You better have tough skin. <laughs> Greg Hart in South Florida after party. By the way, Greg, your cup is on the way. He bought one of the autographed coffee cups. I see a bunch of twos, Gary. It's all oh, two, two, no. two, two, two. No, I'm kidding. It's all <laughs> one, 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 one. <laughs> Kathy Jean, Mickey Griggs, kiddo, Daniel Sweeney. Everybody's saying number one. Uh, nobody's saying number two, nor dare would they on this channel. Somebody might get, you know, get it, thumb smashed. You don't know. All these things happen around here. <laughs> All right. So, uh, uh, Greg wants to know after party, right? Yes. Guys go in the description. Um, the link, I think the, the link will be in the description of this video within two minutes after we end the broadcast. If you guys want to come over to the after party, uh, we're going to sit there and talk. Red and I are going to talk for a few minutes. Red answers questions, and I uh, make comments and voice opinions and have fun. So, <laughs> Gary, once okay. again, buddy, All thank right. you so much for doing this. And uh, and uh, we'll see you, guys, see you guys soon. All right. Take care.